In the second part of the adventure, The Lizard Wizard's Wish, the adventurers head into some very stark, dangerous and volcanic landscapes, encountering creatures well adapted to the harsh, extreme conditions. The gift of writing for fantasy is that we can add creatures that would usually be nothing but myths, legends, folk tales, cryptids and nightmares. We're all mostly familiar with the concept of a giant worm beast in tabletop fantasy. This can range from actual giant earthworms, which are not that terrifying, just kind of disgusting, up to the purple worm, which is a lot like the giant sandworms from Frank Herbert's science fiction epic, The Dune series. But there is another type of rock worm that has been around in tabletop fantasy role-playing for quite a long time. It has had more specific names and lore about a forgotten fantasy realm, but let's look at creatures like this in a much broader, multiversal point of view, shall we? The rock worm is an alien creature, its rocky composition and lack of internal organs might suggest it is just another form of elemental spirit that has made a body for itself to get around in the worlds beyond the realms of earth and fire. But it's only native to those places. It's not an elemental in the strict sense of the word. It is a silicon-based life form. You hear that a lot in shows like Star Trek, in fantasy stories, and not often in fantasy role-playing games. Still, it's something you might find attractive as a way to avoid constantly sweeping things under the collective elementals term, because variety invites investigation and discovery. It's a large part of the fun of role-playing games. Like carbon, silicon can create sufficiently large molecules to carry biological information. However, the scope of possible silicon chemistry is far more limited than that of carbon. It may be limited, but tends to be more refined and pure. It uses things like ammonia instead of water, and hydrocarbon solvents such as methane and ethane. Still, a more interesting variant, which the rockworm uses, involves molten silicate rock that serves as a liquid medium within which their body chemistry takes place. If you take anything of actual use away from this as a person running role-playing games, writing stories or playing a character with some special knowledge of silicon-based life, if the thing loves heat, it will be seriously crippled by cold, and vice versa. Hitting a cold-loving silicon life form with fire may cause it to explode suddenly. It may be that silicate minerals in water played a crucial role very early on when they replicated their crystal structures interacted with carbon compounds and were the precursors of carbon-based life. Probably. Nobody really knows for sure, but in a fantasy world, we can just make this stuff up as we please. It doesn't have to conform to scientific reason, it just makes it more engaging when it sounds a bit scientific. We call this techno-jargon. That's why you're watching this video, really. <clears throat> Another takeaway fact about silicon-based life is that it's always resistant to sulfuric acid and unlikely to be bothered by a reasonably toxic atmosphere or not much of an atmosphere at all. A great example of a silicon-based entity comes from the classic Star Trek episode which features Spock mind-melding with a rocky blob that has been murdering many mine workers. It turns out the creature is just trying to protect its eggs. Mistaken motives are a great source of drama and tension in a fantasy story. The elemental creatures have always been portrayed as being physically and mentally alien. They just don't understand how carbon-based beings operate. And to be fair, we don't understand them very well either. A silicon life form doesn't have to look like it's made of rock, but remember it won't have a lot of complex molecular structures going on. Crystal shapes perhaps, smooth and solid seeming substances, a lack of all the tiny moving parts of a carbon-based meat sack with all its jumbled, folded proteins. The silicon life will be more elegant, less muddled. Crystals can be spectacularly complex in their fractal splendor though. A brilliantly reflective crystal starfish might be a standard form for them. Rockworms are also a pretty good option and not very hard to understand, though as they are simply big brute animals with foul dispositions and a hunger for some excellent minerals, their bodies, particularly their razor sharp pointed tips that form the head of the creatures, are super hot, able to melt through solid rock. I'll leave the details of how big they can grow up to you, but if you are close to the size of a giant snake or some other sort of serpent, you can just use the physical traits of that creature for your game rules and just add in a tremendous proximity heat for the rockworm. So, rockworms on the surface, hmm. The question is not why the rockworm is hunting minerals and is aggressive to anything that gets too close to it. The question is, what is the thing doing up on the surface world? Does it require minerals that have been weathered by the surface somehow? That may be how it absorbs gases and such. It needs to replenish every now and then. Is it coming up to the air and light of the sun to find a mate and reproduce? A bit like sea turtles. 
Sea turtle hatchlings have a rough start to life. They never meet their parent and most of them are picked off by scavengers long before they can return to the beach they were hatched from. Those that do are survivors, either by luck or by some slight advantage in their behaviour or form, and get to pass on those traits to the next generation. That's natural selection for you. Rockworms are likely so aggressive because only those that displayed that sort of behaviour survived to pass these traits on to the next generation. An excellent example in the real world is fur seals. Those pups who displayed no fear or aggression towards humans got killed. Over time and relentless murder by the humans, the passive fur seals were wiped out and now you can expect these lovely creatures to tear your nuts off if you get too close to them. Good for you, fur seals. Never forgive, never forget. So how can we incorporate this into our fantasy world? Imagine a scene where mountain or volcano dwelling people such as fire or mountain giants or more exotic things like salamanders or fire newts in the realms of earth or flame who hunt down, kill and harvest the rockworms for the super strong silicon spike that forms their head. That could be the best material for any number of uses. Perhaps it's just a highly prized decorative object and they doggedly slam the rockworm in the neck until it shatters off and then the creature dies slowly and painfully, no longer able to melt and burrow down through the rock. It could be a substance that makes blades, spear and arrow tips stronger and sharper than any natural obsidian, or it might be useful to form tools that can work any metal or stone, because the tip spike is so incredibly tough. What if chips of the rockworm spike are the actual currency used by that and several other races? Now you're looking at these worms in a different light. They're not just pests and random encounters that are senselessly violent. Now there is a reason why they are so defensively vicious, and a reason why everyone is hunting them down in the first place. Speaking of highly prized silicon products that everyone wants and needs, I'm currently running a Kickstarter for nigh indestructible silicone battle mats. That's right, they're back and better than ever, now slightly thinner to improve how they fold up, roll up, get scrunched or wrap around books, dice, miniatures and marker pens then roll out flat and smooth onto your table every time. Big Pockets tabletop gaming mats now come in paper white, stone grey and parchment yellow. We have print options for one inch square grid and a hex grid perfect for any sort of gameplay. The silicon battle mats measure around three feet by two feet and are one thirty fifth of an inch or 0.7 millimeters thick, which is about seven times the thickness of a standard sheet of printer paper. While the battle mats are around the same size as a big A1 sheet of paper, the silicon can take any sort of wet and dry erase marker pens, you can cook pizza on them in the oven, bake your Sculpey miniatures in terrain, any paints and almost any sort of glue just peels off the non-stick, extremely durable, non-porous and non-toxic silicon surface. They will absolutely last you a lifetime and do the job perfectly. Links to the Kickstarter page can be found just below this video in the description text and my first pinned comment. Thanks for checking it out and thanks for all your support. My name is AJ Pickett, I hope you enjoyed this little discussion today, as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon. I mean, come on, how smooth was that transition into talking about the Silicon Battle Mat Kickstarter? <laughs> about as smooth as the surface of those battle mats.